This is, I have no idea what episode it is. We need to start keeping track of that. Um, but it is February 10th, uh, 2021, uh, Bitcoin bull run. And uh, we are having a presentation on Bitcoin and Big Brother by uh, a good local dear friend, uh, Zach. Zach, how are you, man? I'm doing great. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for doing this. I know uh, just very briefly for, for everybody, um, this is not tax advice, uh, please consult your own tax accountant, tax lawyers, any, anybody that has that professional uh, uh, certificate and all that other good stuff uh, that the government likes. Um, uh, I, I don't want to speak for Zach, but uh, this is um, uh, one person's experience dealing with um, uh, paying taxes uh, from, from crypto. So um, Zach, whenever you are ready, man, again, we're glad to have you. Feel free to take it away and kind of uh, Share us your uh, experience and uh, some tips and tricks for us. All right. Awesome. I, I appreciate you again being here. And uh, it's nice to see some faces on here uh, pre-meeting and getting up, shooting the breeze about some, some block height and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, as Max said, I'm not a uh, tax professional. Uh, my background is in tax and, and uh, accounting and finance. And uh, I just don't do that as a trade and uh, I'm not certified in any means. Um, but as I think most of you know, if you've done taxes before, it's kind of a wild, wild west out there. And, uh, you know, it takes a lot to get a good tax professional uh, that's experienced in this field. So uh, through the many years of trades that I've done and, uh, you know, the you know tens of thousands of trades that I have to account for, um, you know, you kind of cut your teeth on it. So it's just kind of my experience. Like Max said, um, I love Bitcoin, love crypto, love trading it. And uh, just wanted to share some, some things I've learned along the way. So uh, without further ado, um, I'll hop into some of the material. So I wanted to uh, do a little uh, background. A lot of people are unclear on how much time the IRS has been involved on taxes here in the U.S. Again, this is kind of focused towards U.S. markets. If anybody is you know, from the UK or anywhere else, uh, you know, this doesn't necessarily pertain to you, um, really just the US. Uh, but back in 2014, the IRS actually released a virtual currency guidance. Um, and they kind of outlined everything pretty clearly at that time, uh, when it comes to taxing and taxation on crypto. Um, and, you know, as the subsequent years came forward, 2015, 2016, uh, they outlined it a little bit further. Uh, obviously, we were talking about it before uh, the, the webinar, but uh, in, I think it was November 2016, Coinbase uh, actually had a summons and they had to release customer data. Um, so, you know, they, there's been a lot of data collection early on. Um, and I would say even pre-2014, it was just when it was officially announced was 2014. Uh, so the IRS has been in the game pretty long. Uh, and they've, they've really, I mean, since 2016, they actually launched an, an official crypto task force. Um, I remember when that announcement was made and they actually partnered with some really big analytics firms. Um, and at that point, they had summoned data from like Binance and crack, you know, all these other exchanges at that point. Um, so from that point forward, uh, it's kind of been, uh, you know, like a snowball effect. Everything's kind of been steamrolling uh, forward. And uh, they, in 2018, there was IRS Transnational Crypto Tax Task Force that was launched. I think it's called uh, Five Something. I, I forgot. It's, it starts with five. It's basically five of these countries um, and then some letter afterwards. And then uh, in 2019, uh, they basically further clarified by sending some additional educational letters out to any crypto holders that they knew of uh, and just general public. And then in October, they obviously launched some more guidance on airdrops. I think as we've continued forward down this train, uh, you know, the IRS has been trying to re-clarify things that they initially had stated in 2014. And uh, now you, <laughs> you can open up your tax form this year, and it's going to be one of the first questions that you see uh, when you go to like TurboTax or anything like that. So uh, it probably should be one of the first questions that your tax provider uh, asks you as well. So it's, it's getting a high level of uh, visibility now. Um, and really what it came down to 
was that the IRS it was collecting data for such a long time. They just kind of came out at the end of 2020 and, and read it as the commissioner. He said, uh, you know, basically they're transitioning from an investigation uh, to enforcement, um, really uh, launching a full-blown attack. And when I say attack, just a, a scoop and, and a collection of data and actually enforcement of that tax data really starting this year forward, uh, which also they can look at back years. Um, so I, I think they have enough data at this point to start really um, you know, digging into the details. Uh, so there's some things that are going on, like in September of 2020, uh, the IRS is now doing uh, <laughs> a crowdsourcing to a certain extent, and they're uh, launching little, uh, you know, like headhunters fees, $625,000 to develop a tool that can crack privacy coins. I, I've traded Monero in the past, um, you know, I, you know, Verge or any of the other privacy tokens, um, you know, they're, they're trying to get some more information, obviously, in those areas. So uh, they've done, you know, little software programs uh, where, you know, they'll pay people to try and crack something that they can't do themselves. Uh, we see that in a lot of different crowdsourcing extents. So um, main point really is just saying, you know, it's on the IRS's radar. It's been developing and it's getting more aggressive as time goes on. Uh, just because they want to account for, you know, the money that's due to them to a certain extent, the way that they view it. So uh, I know that kind of flies in the face of the original purpose of crypto, um, but now it's kind of under Big Brother, this whole crypto blanket. Um, so anyways, with that being said, I would really like to get into this kind of spurred and, and Max and I had talked about doing this presentation uh, because there was some sort of discussion on what was actually a taxable event. Um, that fortunately is very clear. Uh, and it's been made clear for quite, quite some time, actually. Um, so for taxable events, uh, I just listed out uh, standard taxable events. Um, so basically everything's a taxable event. Uh, cryptocurrency to fiat currency transaction, that's a taxable event. Uh, a crypto to crypto transaction, uh, that's a taxable event, which some don't know, even the stable coin transaction. So let's say you use Tether. I've used Tether on Binance. Uh, Tether isn't pegged exactly one for one. So any fluctuation in Tether is actually a taxable event. So, I mean, everything's taxable at that point. Um, so using cryptocurrency for a good or a service, uh, that is actually a taxable event. Um, so, you know, if you buy a piece of bread, uh, whatever gains be on that crypto uh, that you had during, you know, even if it's 10 minutes, that's a taxable event. Um, when you mine crypto uh, at the time that the block reward is received, uh, that is a taxable event. Airdrops are taxable. Yield farming, like I don't know if anybody's into sushi or any sort of like yield pools or staking for that matter. Uh, whenever a reward is received, that is a taxable event. And any forked coins, uh, you know, if, if there's a fork uh, that happens, that is also uh, a taxable event when it's received. So, uh, you know, there's really... Uh, there's really nothing that's not taxable. <laughs> it's uh, it's kind of a cover blanket. So there's there's really two events uh, that are not taxable events. It's when you buy cryptocurrency, and when you move a coin between wallets. Um, something that most people don't know, uh, and I may be uh, saying stuff that you maybe already know, but this was something that was kind of news to me when I started doing investigation. Was any sort of wallet uh, transfer? It's not a taxable event, but you actually do have to account for it on your taxes. Um, which is kind of mind boggling. And obviously if you do that, the IRS has a huge visibility in the wallets, but it, part of that, the, the blanket or the clause or the reason why they do that is to track your cost basis and to understand which specific Bitcoin that you're using, right? Uh, for tracking cost basis. So that's how they kind of are spinning that portion. Um, but overall, I mean, there's basically every event is a taxable event, um, which is, yeah, a lot of people don't think cryptocurrency to cryptocurrency transactions are taxable events, uh, and they are. Uh, I've had many discussions on that. Um, you know, when you pay for a good or a service, there's so many people that are like, oh, yeah, I bought that with Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, they had no clue that they had to pay taxes on that. Um, you know, mining crypto, uh, whenever your block reward is received, obviously you're paying taxes. So, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions. And, uh, you know, as some have pointed out previously on the call, there's a lot of confusion uh, surrounding it. But, uh, you know, fortunately, it's actually very clear uh, in the legislature that's written. Um, so I just wanted to kind of clear the air on that uh, regarding crypto taxable events versus non taxable. Um, 
what I would like to also talk about, um, and again, we can we can go back and touch on any of these slides at the end uh, oh, when you have when when and if you have questions. Um, but I wanted to point out some uh, maybe some tips here uh, that I've learned over the the years um, that may help you. Uh, obviously, because you know this is a crypto community, and, and you know want to give back. But um, one really unique thing to crypto, and I think a lot of wealthy people uh, have been trying to lever leverage this. Um, so when you sell your crypto, uh, you can you can sell it at a loss, right? Like on a big Bitcoin dip, and you can buy that back, right? And you can claim whatever capital loss was on that crypto. Now this is. Um, this is unlike equities and stocks. Uh, there's a wash sale rule in stocks. It's a 30 day wash sale rule. So, you know, you can do tax harvesting with equities, um, but it's a 30 day vesting period. So if you buy back within that 30 day period, uh, basically that capital gains or capital loss in this case couldn't be accounted for. With crypto, it's immediate. So, you know, we all know that crypto is extremely um, volatile. But you could flash, sell, and buy, and you know, count that against your capital loss, right, for that year, uh, and you could apply that against your capital gains tax. Um, so, I mean, that's that's a huge benefit to uh, crypto uh, that not a lot of people know or is underutilized. Um, also, that loss, if you don't want to, if let's say that you don't sell any equities or you don't sell any other crypto during that year, uh, you can apply that uh, to your actual income in that given tax year, up to $3,000. So let's say that uh, I, you know, Zach, I, I decided to sell my Bitcoin at a $20,000 loss, right? Um, I could take that as a capital loss and apply it against any capital gains. Now, if I don't have any capital gains in that year, I can actually apply a 3,000 of that to my income. Uh, so I don't have to pay taxes on that 3,000 income. Then the rest of that $20,000 loss, the $17,000, will carry over into the following tax year indefinitely. Um, so, you know, there's there's a lot of benefits to managing that uh, part of your portfolio. Um, so that's that's actually one unique thing that's very different than equities when it comes to crypto. Uh, now that is being looked at to be changed uh, potentially in the future, but for now that stands. Um, now for people that do trades, uh, any gas fees, this is something else that uh, not a lot of people know, but at the time of transaction, uh, a gas fee can be applied at your cost basis. Uh, so let's say you traded, you know, or well, we were just talking about this, Max, right? Like how much it costs to, uh, to move your sats, right? Well, yeah, um, right there. So if it's a, so right for that example, if it's 150 sats provided and it's $10 for me to move my Bitcoin over to an exchange, technically speaking, I can, again, as long as you account for it, you're saying technically I can deduct that set uh, per byte fee uh, from, your tax from, my, from my tax. Okay. Okay. That's correct. Wow. Yeah. From your tax basis, you can. Yep. Wow. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, that's, those are things that are, you know, little nuances that, uh, you know, can really benefit you in the long run uh, for donations. This is another one that's, um, you know, not super well known. So let's say that you bought a Bitcoin at a thousand dollars and you donated at 40,000 uh, bucks. You're going to owe a lot on taxes, right? It's whatever your tax bracket is, you're going to pay that tax on that crypto. Um, if you have a ton of capital gains during that given year, uh, you, you know, it may behoove you to, to donate a Bitcoin, right? Because what you don't have to do is you don't have to pay taxes on that capital gains for that Bitcoin that you give away. So you can take a full $40,000 write-off for that Bitcoin as a donation, as a gift. Um, so something that you would have to pay taxes on, you know, you lose 25, 30% of the value of it. Uh, you can actually apply that against capital gains. So, you know, if you give or if you give to church or, you know, in my case, you know, like if you, you know, if you tithe or whatever, um, you know, this is a potential way to get some tax benefit um, where you're not, we're not taxed. Makes if that makes sense. Just being in Battle Creek, then I don't have to worry. Like, even if I oh. work till five, shit, I can be back to the cottage, but. Yeah. Oh, no, nope, sorry. Uh, Go ahead. It's, it's, it's all good. No, no worries. Um, so anyways, uh, that's that's a, a good way to bypass capital gains um, on specific capital gains uh, throughout the year if you want if you do and if you participate in donating so uh, that's another good one uh, I know this is huge and taboo and it's not necessarily um, liked uh, in the crypto community because the point of crypto is to use it 
uh, or the initial thought was to use it. Um, but, but don't pay for goods and services with cryptocurrency. <laughs> it's pretty simple, um, especially if you've held it for a long time. And I can get into the next, uh, the specific ID and HIFO type of accounting uh, principles. But uh, really, there's no point to buy anything with Bitcoin. Uh, it's just, it doesn't make any expense, uh, uh, unless you're at a loss, right? And, you know, 2018, 2019, you know, it may have made sense, but anything that appreciates, um, you know, you're probably going to pay capital gains on, especially people that got in the game early. Um, so, I, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend that uh, for people. And, uh, and I'll get into that a little bit later. But what you have to think about is when you're accounting for all this on, on uh, you know, like a cost basis and uh, taxable events, uh, it actually, there's different tiers and brackets on these tax softwares for crypto. And uh, it actually costs a lot of money as you go up in trades. Uh, I think on some of these platforms like Cointracker, I mean, if you're over a thousand trades, you're paying $400 for them to calculate all your tax basis. So the reason why, you know, I wouldn't recommend paying for goods and services, uh, you have to understand the block and time frame for that payment. So you need to know your cost basis and what it costs at that time. You need to track that and it needs to go into some sort of, uh, you know, tax software, right? And each one of those purchases that you make is actually a taxable event. So you're going to be paying more to a software company if you're not tracking this by yourself. And I wouldn't recommend it if you're regularly using it because it's really complex and there's a lot of ways you can misreport. Uh, you're going to be paying a lot on the back end when you go to, you know, calculate your taxes. Uh, so that's that's why I would I would put that as a tip. Um, also, uh, if you do decide to to pay for goods and services. I would highly recommend uh, using like specific ID or HIFO that's high end first out. Um, but if you have specific ID, you can actually choose what Bitcoin uh, you want to use for a specific transaction. So let's say that you did want to use Bitcoin. Again, this is very cumbersome and it takes a lot of time to track all this stuff. And it's, it's not very fluid at this point, uh, but you could technically, if you knew the block and if you knew uh, your cost basis on your specific Bitcoin and you knew the transaction uh, code for that um, and you could track all that to the purchase of your good, you could say, well, I use X Bitcoin to purchase that loaf of bread. And if you had bought that today and the price of Bitcoin didn't really move all that much, which is probably unlikely, um, you know, you could specifically ID that Bitcoin and use that. So you could limit your taxable, uh, you know, your taxable, uh, amounts in that regards. But again, uh, you know, if you're going to be using crypto or trading crypto, I would recommend like a specific ID or a HIFO, but it takes a lot of tracking. And then uh, the last tip, and Max and I were laughing about this, I would highly recommend people getting into crypto to not use Robinhood or PayPal or some sort of gateway, because uh, you, you actually can't transfer the underlying crypto asset. So you don't really have ownership of that specific um, crypto unit, right? Um, which is, is a, a huge disadvantage because if you need to move that, you actually have to cash out. Uh, so you're looking at multiple taxable events, um, you know, if you really want to hold crypto on those Robinhood or PayPal accounts. Um, yeah, I wouldn't even consider it really holding crypto. Um, so anyways, uh, that being said, those are some uh, crypto tax tips that I, I have found useful. Um, and I, I hope that you would find it useful as well if you didn't know it already. Um, with that being said, I really wanted to share with you this IRX, uh, IRS tax penalties and statutes of limitations. Uh, what I think is going to happen is I think there's going to be a flushing out. Obviously, it started with Coinbase and 10,000 people. Um, but the IRS has been very transparent. They've been collecting data for a while and they know who has it and doesn't have it. And they will eventually, I mean, they're partnering with analytics firms. They're eventually probably going to roll it out to a lot of people. Um, so there are uh, uh, tax penalties and statutes and limitations. Uh, there are clauses for late payment and failure, failure to file. Uh, both of those are at a maximum of 25% of your unpaid taxes, but failure to file, I mean, it adds up very quickly to that 25%. Um, you basically, it's 5% of your unpaid tax for each month uh, up until 25%. So, I mean, that quickly, you know, 
<laughs> it quickly adds up and then it caps out. Um, so, you know, not only do you have to pay whatever your tax bracket was in that year, uh, even dating back, technically it would probably be about six years if they uh, audited you, um, but you'd have to pay an additional 25% on top of that, which no one really wants to do that. Um, so when we look at how far back they can audit, generally, if you get audited, it's three years. In this case, I think it would be six uh, for anybody that was found to have not reported their crypto taxes. Uh, generally, that's about six. Um, and like uh, Max and I were talking about, if you if you have huge sums, uh, their statute limit limitations is 10 years. So, I mean, if you have a huge stack and you sat on it and you traded it for who, who knows how long, you know, every year you traded it for 10 years, uh, you know, you're probably going to have a pretty nasty conversation. Uh, so anyways, uh, I just wanted to lay that out. The, this is kind of the liability that's on the line for, for not doing this. Um, and ultimately, uh, you know, if you haven't, so especially this year and last year, a lot of tax filings were amended uh, for previous back taxes. Um, a substantial amount of back taxes were made. Uh, what you can do is you can go in and amend your previous uh, filings to account for your specific transactions in those years. Um, and typically, if you go back six years, uh, you, you know they'll consider that as good standing. So they won't go 10 years back on that. Um, so I just wanted to share with you what I've learned, uh, you know, because that was a question that I had uh, when I was calculating my taxes. And uh, it's good to just see that on paper to see what that liability or risk is. Um, and ultimately, I mean, if you can use crypto favorably, obviously, there are some very favorable parts of crypto that is better than equities. Uh, I don't see why you wouldn't leverage that and use that to your tax advantage. You know, if you're a US citizen, you know, it probably would behoove you to to do that. Um, but nonetheless, uh, with that being said, uh, there's a few tax preparation resources that I've listed here. There are quite a few others. Um, I don't know the level of trading that is in this group right now. I don't know how many trades you do, what platforms you do it on. I mean, I've traded across a lot of platforms. Um, I actually just recently, Binance did not, does not support US customers and Binance US doesn't support a whole lot of tokens. So I, I don't really like that as much. And the trading platform isn't that great anymore. So I've been using Kraken. Um, but I've, I've used quite a few of these exchanges. Um, what I've used typically in the past is Bitcoin.tax. Um, it's got a limited user interface, but it's low cost. Uh, for somebody that has a lot of trades, I would prefer low cost to anything else. You have Zen Ledger, Coin Tracker, and all these guys have podcast. They've been on po podcasts like Unchained. There's a couple of Bitcoin podcasts that, you know, all this information I'm sharing with you, you know, there, there's CPA, tax accountants, and everybody that has talked about it at some point. Um, but those are two other tracking sources uh, where you can generate tax reports from. Uh, but again, it's really high cost. Uh, anything over a thousand transactions, um, they, they either put you in a get a quote bracket, which is you know, probably over three or four hundred dollars. Or uh, I think on I think on Zen Ledger, it was like a, a cap out or max out of 400 bucks to use their software if you have a lot of trades. Um, like I said, there's multiple other um, sources for Bitcoin tax reporting. Um, but all of these link up with TurboTax, like Bitcoin tax has a, uh, a link with TurboTax. It's relatively easy. I think for all of my transactions, like for like say 14, 15,000 transactions, I think I paid maybe 50 or 60 bucks to report it um, and get it all consolidated. So, you know, in some cases, the lower cost options I would prefer, even though they're not super sexy. So um, anyways. Just wanted to share a few resources. Again, there are other ones, but I would highly suggest, um, you know, being careful uh, how many transactions you make because you're going to be paying a lot on the back end to record and track all the cost basis on that through some sort of service provider. Um, with that being said, I think that that is a very high level uh, consolidated view of.